So welcome to our very first episode of this uh, new podcast on body politics in the 21st century. The Cambridge Centre for International Research has given me the great but challenging opportunity of exploring what we do to our bodies, what sort of norms define what we should do with our bodies and who gets to decide what is beautiful, healthy or desirable. And this podcast will have six episodes and in each episode I will interview a different researcher on their like specific topic, which means we will cover everything from body positivity, which is the topic for today, to plastic surgery, to using apps and self-tracking. So we'll cover a whole range of topics on body politics in this century. And today I'm really, really grateful and happy to welcome Dr. Amy Slater, who's an associate professor at UWE Bristol in the Center for Appearance Research. And Amy has written extensively on how we view our body, what body image is, how it forms within children and adolescents, and you know the harms that can follow from bad body image. And today I will question her on everything regarding that. We will talk about you know, all these hashtag fitspo, hashtag body positivity, and how we sort of navigate that landscape today in social media and our internet lives. So Amy, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for so, having me. It's lovely to be here. <laughs> I already mentioned that you work in the Center for Appearance Research, which, to be quite honest, um, is... I guess a bit weird or normal. I never heard of anything like that before. I didn't know it mm. existed. And I mean, I read online that it's the biggest center for mm -hmm. anything related appearance. So why do you think it's necessary to have something like that? So mm -hmm. what are the topics you explore and why is it so important to do that at this point in time? Mm. You're right. I'm, I'm very privileged to work at the Center for Appearance Research at uh, the University of the West of England, Bristol. And as you noted, we are the largest group of researchers in the world that are researching issues to do with appearance. We're actually now a team of over 40 researchers and we all share a passion for appearance research and particularly for sort of our mission, which is increasing the acceptance of diversity in appearance. So we, many of us research issues around body image, but also many of us also research issues around um, understanding the experiences of people that might have an altered or an unusual appearance, sometimes what we call a visible difference, whether that be, um, say a congenital condition like a craniofacial condition or an acquired um, appearance difference so whether that's from a, a skin condition or a burn or um, something that's a result of treatment like for instance cancer treatment can alter appearance so we study the experiences of anyone who has um, an appearance concern and as I said yeah we're sort of united in our passion for um, increasing the acceptance of diverse appearances in society. And what was it that got you into working on, on these sorts of things? What, you know, inspire you to work on this kind of research that you do now? Mm, that's a good question. Um, it was a long time ago now, but um, I had a wonderful uh, lecturer when I was an undergraduate um, student in Australia um, who was a world leader in research um, in body image and, you know, had a fantastic lecture one day and she really uh, ignited my interest in that area and I ended up doing my undergraduate dissertation with her and then PhD and studying for many years um, particularly started by understanding the influence of body image in dancers um, and in, in adolescent dancers and in also in um, young adults who used to be dancers. Um, I think that was a personal interest of mine at the time, but then that sort of extended into understanding body image um, concerns in a range of different sports and um, exercise settings. And um, yeah, that's where it all started. So I think, um, yeah, I can't uh, underestimate the influence of an inspiring lecturer. <laughs> That made me curious, what, what is so special about dancers? Um, I mean, as I said, that came from a personal interest of mine. I, okay. I used to be a dancer at that time and um, the research, so particularly ballet, classical dance, um, we've known from the research that this is an environment that has an increased prevalence of disordered eating and eating disorders. Um, and I was really interested in understanding 
yeah, the role of body image more broadly in that setting. It's a, you know, it's a, a unique environment and particularly classical dance has a very, um, you know, has a na very narrow body ideal that's sort of accepted and uh, encouraged for that, um, for, for ballet. Um, and it, I think it, I started to think that it really encourages a very unique perspective on how we look at our bodies and how we view and appreciate our bodies. So I was interested in understanding uh, the effects of those and particularly with the former dancers, I was, like, what, I was interested in what happens to our view of ourselves once we no longer <laughs> are in that environment, but has it altered how we um, come to think and view our bodies, even so, if we're not. Mm. So was that something, so when dancers sort of stop dancing I suppose mm. um would they like struggle with keeping up this disappearance and what they were trained to well that's what I did find in one of my early studies was that in um young adult women those that used to dance that no longer dance still had what we would call probably poorer body image and poorer um disordered eating behaviors compared to similar women but who had never been um classical dancers so yeah that was sort of what I was interested in exploring at that time and indeed what we found so that sort of um, gives some weight to that theory that spending many years in that environment and viewing um, our bodies in a very particular and unique way uh, may have sort of long-lasting impacts on how we come to think and feel about our bodies. It's so interesting because it reminds me of an episode I think of the BBC Women's Hour um, I heard a couple, couple of weeks maybe months ago and they talked about gymnastics and young girls mm -hmm. who do gymnastics and many of them sort of told their stories of that it was of course a very competitive and uh, mm -hmm. environment and loads of pressure on performing and looking a certain way and many of them also reflected that there's this I guess paradox to someone who's like to I don't know, someone like me who has never done like super competitive sports in their life, who think that people who do competitive sports are the most healthy people out there. And this is what, you, like, if you want to be at peak health, this is what you do. But actually many of them reflected that this was a very unhealthy time in their lives. And it mm. sort of influenced, like, as you said, you know, how they viewed their body and how they viewed food and exercise mm. for years after and in a really restrictive and negative mm. way. And actually yeah. that they became much healthier after they left this environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. I mean, my study that I mentioned back then was only at one snap point and probably relative, the women were still relatively young. So they probably hadn't been that long out of that environment. But um, yeah, there's definitely other research that has looked at other competitive sports that have sometimes they're, they're called different things. So sometimes they're called sort of aesthetic sports or lean sports, you know, so there's, so if you think about say, for instance, classical dance, obviously that's um, aesthetics is very important and it's how the body looks in, in, a, in particular positions, but then things like gymnastics, um, you know, there's also, uh, you know, a requirement to be lean, to be able to do many of the activities, but however, there's still a very heavy emphasis on aesthetics and how the body appears in all the positions and things like that. And then other sports have also found increased sort of risk of uh, body image concerns and disordered eating when they have that sort of leanness or weight requirement. Um, was, I'm thinking of like diving and, and some of the yeah. swimmings where it's, you know, it's, it's necessary for the sport for you to be um, particularly lean. Um, some research has found that those types of sports have poorer outcomes in terms of body image and, mm -hmm. and eating outcomes. I mean, before we dive deeper into sort of the research you do now at body image, um, I really wanted to ask you what you think about New Year's resolutions. I mean, we're like three <laughs> weeks into, you know, 2021. It's mm -hmm. been like some people have probably abandoned theirs already. Um, <laughs> I'm sure many have. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, like it's something that is like still very prevalent and it's something that just comes up every year and then there's I feel like just two different narratives going on at the same time mm -hmm. especially on social media one is you really this is like a time for you to reflect and you should set news resolution people still do and often these are tied to losing weight exercising more being more healthy something along those lines but I think there's also like this current 
going on at the same time, which tells you, you know, you should be gentle to yourself. They don't work anyway. If you want to change something, just do it tomorrow. It doesn't matter whether, you know, it's mm-hmm. what time of the year. They're like restrictive anyway. So like, what do you think is, is the final mm-hmm. verdict on New Year's resolution? And is there like a healthier way to set goals or? <laughs> Well, I guess very broadly speaking, I think having a goal and have a a plan of how one might achieve that goal can be a good thing for people. However, as you very rightly noted, we know that many New Year's resolutions focus on weight loss and can uh, sort of wrapped in extremely damaging messages about fixing or changing our bodies. And these are often accompanied by fat phobic messages, which are Mm. damaging in themselves and also uh, often encourage dangerous dieting practices, as you know, which um, we know just simply do not work. So given the fact that that's what a majority of New Year resolution pushes that we see particularly on social media no I'm not generally a fan of new year's resolutions and particularly anything that encourages weight loss um you know these are just designed to profit a weight loss and diet industries that profit on making us feel bad about ourselves um so yeah not generally a fan I mean what I notice is actually like on my social media and this is of course like you know Mm. this one bubble and we know that like social media looks very different to to different people and what they consume but what i notice on mine is that loads of people this year are like promoting this like juice cleansing and Mm -hmm. i felt like this is just you know another new way as you say of like companies making money of this idea that um you know now's the time of the year where you sort of like cleanse your body and you don't eat anything for three days and just magically your body is reset after three days which is of course not how it works but these companies make a lot of money of that and I just thought like when I saw that I was like it really just sort of keeps reinventing the wheel I guess every year yeah and you're right I mean particularly anything that's encouraging extreme weight loss and things like those cleanses are potentially really harmful to our health health um so you know I think those sorts of messages are terrible and that you know they're promoting that quick fix which we know as I said from the research just doesn't doesn't work doesn't exist um and encouraging us to sort of buy into these sort of very toxic messages that we can do something you know, in three days you're going to be a completely different version of yourself yeah. and you know inherent in those messages that they, you're going to be that you're going to be well obviously you're going to be thinner but you're also going to be happier and better version of yourself and we just know that that's just complete rubbish <laughs> yeah um yeah so i mean we've dropped the the big name of body image a couple of times so you mm-hmm. research mm-hmm. you research body image broadly and in children adolescence mm-hmm. um so how much how dangerous is it how much pressure is in body image and is negative body image something that sort of children I guess inflict on themselves so it's something they receive messages about and then they really put pressure on themselves or is body image also something that's mediated by the sort of environment we're in so family school what kind of like polls are there it's a really great quite great question that you ask there um We certainly do see individual differences in body image and some of in in, in how, you know, we come to think and feel about our bodies and appearance. And, um, you know, we we see diversity in, um, yeah, how people think and feel about their bodies. And some may feel generally negative and some may feel more generally positive. And some of these differences may be explained perhaps by individual differences in say, let's say personality factors. For example, you know, we might have sort of almost innate differences in say self-esteem or perfectionism. Mm. You know, you might be Mm. much higher than I am or vice versa. But at the same time, it's also safe, I think, to say that we're not born with negative body image. We don't come out as, you know, babies and young children thinking negatively about our bodies and appearances. So 
the dominant sort of theoretical model for understanding body image is sometimes called the sociocultural model mm. um, and it examines as it says in its name the social and cultural factors that influence how we come to think about our bodies and appearances and this model particularly emphasizes the influence of parents peers and the media mm. for being really critical forces in how we come to think about our bodies and appearances. Um, and most of the research is really centered around trying to understand those influences. And, you know, I guess they also point to avenues for intervention as well, which we might discuss perhaps later. But um, yeah, so I think it's a great question that you're getting at, but I think probably the dominant model that many of us who work in this field are really focusing on those social and cultural um, influences while also acknowledging that then there are going to be mm. individual differences in how perhaps we react to those um, social and cultural influences but you know we are all existing in this world that has all these messages and pressures coming to us about how we perhaps should look. So when you do research on these kind of influences how do you sort of pull these different mm. influences apart because I can imagine that of course, parents in turn are influenced by the media they consume course, and peers yeah. as well. So how do you sort of, you know, get to where the mm. cause or the most influential yeah. relationship is? Another fantastic question. But you're right. These things, of course, don't exist by themselves. And so we can't really, I mean, although we may sometimes do pieces of research that are trying to understand perhaps the influence of one of those factors we might do some you know some research trying to look at the messages that we get from say our parents and trying to understand perhaps that path of the the model it's it's impossible mm. as I said to sort of tease these things apart because we are existing in this society where the the messages and themes about bodies and appearances are coming to us from all avenues and yeah. we could never I mean um, we could never try to sort of understand the parts you know as separate from the other parts so it's, it is complex and of course the research is imperfect and we try to understand the different parts but then how they fit together as a whole and of course then there's other factors that might influence the those mm -hmm. and yeah it was a, you're absolutely right when we're looking at say the influence of parents they of course themselves are influenced by how the messages they got from their parents or their peers or the media that they consume right now um so yeah really really complex but we just try to do our best to try to understand yeah. all the different factors um and think of them how they might come together as a whole as well so what are some of the the harms of negative body image? Um, I mean, I asked that specifically because I think I read in one of your papers and that, that really struck me because I've never thought of that before. Um, I think I read that there was um, some relationship between negative body image and dropping out of other life activities. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that's a very sort of long reaching consequence. Um, I feel like often yeah. we think about like, disordered eating or something like that but that seems a really really grave consequence if um, yeah. I'd never thought of that before yeah absolutely um, you know we now have decades worth of research trying to understand the the negative consequences of negative body image and you're right that um, particularly uh, probably the majority of this research and particularly the earlier research has really focused on um, one particularly negative consequence which is eating disordered eating disorders or and or disordered eating behaviors um, and we know that that's a really well established link um, but we also see a whole host of other negative consequences of body negative body image um, if we think about mental health we see links with increased depression increased anxiety lowered self-esteem we also see a whole host of health consequences. Um, sometimes we also think of these as sort of risky behaviours, but we see links between poorer body image and uh, poorer nutrition, lack of exercise, uh, increased smoking, drinking, drug use, um, increased unsafe sexual practices. So, yeah, a really, you know, a wide reaching uh, range of health consequences. Um, which are really critical for us to consider. But 
yeah, you're really, you're right. Lots of people don't think about the sort of what we might call life activities or life engagement. And it's really important um, that we start to understand these more in detail. Um, we have seen links between, and this is generally in young girls and young adolescents, those who feel more negatively about their bodies and appearance and what you sort of refer to there is the joining in activity. So for instance, this might be young people um, reporting that they don't put their hand up in class um, when they feel badly about their appearance that day, not joining in in say extracurricular activities, not wanting to pay, yeah. perhaps go to the, the sport or social activity. And we also see some research that points to this might also lead to reduced participation in social justice issues. So oh, wow, okay. So these, as as you yeah. um, really point out, these have some really important academic and social consequences for women and girls here as well. You know, if young girls aren't putting their hand up or speaking up in class or speaking up to sort of push back on social justice issues yeah. because they feel badly about their appearance or they're you know concerned that it's going to draw um, attention to themselves when they don't feel confident in themselves this is critical and has really important um, long-reaching um, negative consequences so yeah I, it's great that you picked up on that it's something that has probably been less studied in the past but we are now um, sort of really appreciating the wide-reaching consequences of negative body image yeah I mean I think it's just it really shows you the impact of these these things that we sometimes like see in the like just operating in a really restricted way. And it reminds me when I was reading about menstruation and menstrual shame. Um, there was this mm -hmm. research um, about why so many girls drop out really early of out of school sports and sports mm -hmm. more generally, and girls really early on start on lacking behind boys in like reaching um, activity goals for yeah. day. And the metaphor they use, and I found that really powerful, is that girls often feel like they're on this invisible stage. So mm -hmm. um, they can't just sort of live in their bodies and move around, but they always feel like watched by someone. And they always mm -hmm. also adopt this sort of outside judgmental mm -hmm. perspective on themselves. And I found mm -hmm. that really powerful be because like, I feel like I've experienced that in my life and I can see how yeah. someone with negative body image constantly sees themselves as being judged from outside and always is not just sort of subjectively in the moment but has this outside perspective on themselves yeah and that um so what you're talking about there has also received a lot of research so there's a um a feminist um psychological theory that um has been developed back in the 90s now so it's now you know over 20 years of research in this and that is um theory is called objectification theory yeah. and it's exactly what you're talking about there is that girls and women are particularly are socialized to start to think of their bodies um as an object to be viewed by mm. an observer uh, from an outside perspective and that we're you know we're socialized and culturalized to think in this way um and that then we adopt this perspective ourselves so that and this is called self-objectification so exactly as you said that so that we start to think of ourselves from the observer's perspective so what is my body looking like right now on the outside and we see this manifested behaviorally by sort of the checking behaviors you know yeah. we're constantly thinking about how our clothes you know might look from the outside and how our bodies might look to the outside perspective and this in itself has been shown to have a number of negative consequences one of which is is being linked to body dissatisfaction but also anxiety about our appearance um, there's also some suggestion that it might be linked to a reduced awareness of our internal bodily states yeah so you know if I'm constantly thinking mm. about what my body looks like on the outside perhaps it's leaving me with less resources to be thinking about the internal bodily processes yeah. Yeah. um also being linked to yeah, depression um and also reduction in sexual functioning and pleasure mm -hmm. and you know you can think about that from women's perspective again if we're constantly yeah. sort of thinking about how our body is looking particularly in um you know acts of intimacy then the the potential for enjoyment 
um, may be reduced. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess it's something like an sort of added mental load that you always sort mm-hmm. of carry with yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think I was talking to to Claire Chambers about this recently, and mm-hmm. we were talking about how these sort of self-objectification acts, interestingly, because we like live them often and for so long, we often don't need like explicit negative judgments by other people. We just live yeah. sort of- Yeah, we do them ourselves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's not even that at some point we need someone who explicitly says like, you you look yeah. ugly or fat or anything like yeah. that. We, yeah. we just internalize it and we sort of self-police, I yeah. guess, our bodies. And Absolutely. I think that, yeah. I- and that's the, the the sort of theory was originally talking about, you know, we live in this culture where our bodies are um, objectified from the outside. And perhaps the, you know, the easiest or the most blatant way to think about is that is sort of the male gaze or, yeah. you know, being catcalled or receiving direct negative co- uh, comments on our bodies. You know, that's the sort of most blatant way. But as you said, the, the, the theory then goes on to say that then, but that we internalize this ourselves. Yeah. So that then um, besides those um, sort of explicit um, experiences, we're also doing it ourselves, And perhaps that's, you know, that's a protective mechanism as well yep. to be constantly monitoring yeah. in case these um, messages are going to come to us. And back to your original point. Yeah, that's actually um, about sport. You were, you were saying about yes. lack of girls' engagement in yep. sport. That's actually what? many years many many years ago now but that's what I conducted my PhD research on which was around um girls adolescent girls um participation in sport and particularly trying to understand why it's at lower levels than boys and whether and I was particularly interested in exploring whether there was a role of body image in that um and you know and some of that research um was uh, asking young girls to so doing focus groups with young girls about why they may or may not choose to participate in sports activities and there's a whole host of reasons that are gendered reasons really like lack of opportunities for girls compared mm-hmm. to boys um but and and then some around girls not wanting to uh, participate in a competitive level so perhaps yeah. lack of opportunities for more social um opportunities to move our bodies in different ways Um, but some of the reasons that they gave definitely were related to body image which Mm. is not feeling comfortable yeah and there's some that you know seem quite trivial in a way that you know we could do something about this quite easily there's some comments about uh, uniforms Mm. um, you know which seem like such an obvious thing like you know if we just let girls wear whatever they want to move their bodies in (laughs) they may enjoy moving their bodies more um but yeah many did talk about that feeling of you know not feeling comfortable in their bodies or feeling like their bodies were being observed in a way that they didn't enjoy in that um environment and that's that's terrible and something that we really need to do something about I mean, I don't know if you researched this specifically, but one question that came to mind to me now is, do you think that having like sort of gender or sex segregated sports helps with alleviating body image issues? So is it easier for girls to participate if they know like their sports group is just other girls? Or do we actually see like some benefit in sexually mixed sport groups? I haven't particularly done research in that in fact I'm just thinking back though it did come up in many of the groups that I um I studied many years ago actually it came up as this sort of conundrum for girls some girls reported this was just even this wasn't even in um sporting you know in sort of formal sport this was even just playing sports at lunch times and things some of the girls reported this real conundrum that they were perceived if they did want to be physically active and then they were playing perhaps with boys and they were received potentially received very poorly by other girls as either oh you're just doing that to play with the boys or you know you're not feminine enough you know there was this real um lose-lose situation for girls um in that in that way um but with regards to separation of 
PE perhaps here in schools? Yeah, I haven't done research, but I think that there probably is research that girls says that girls report that they prefer an environment of females only mm. in that setting so that they don't have to also factor in the the male gaze or the male yeah. observation of their bodies in that setting. But yeah, not something that I've really looked at too much more. I mean, it's so interesting because I feel like when I look back at my school sports time, which is of course like not long ago at all, right? Um, like I can think of so many, like now that I think back, I can think of so many things that happened where I would now say like, clearly these were not conducive to positive body image. Like I remember one point, I think we were doing like some form of like karate or something, like some form of martial yeah. arts. And we were like publicly weighed in front of everyone else oh, and then no. assigned to like the person closest to oh. our like weight range. And now thinking yeah. back to that, like that was, you know, in the 2010s, right? It's not like that was in the 80s. Um, and yeah. back to that, it just seems egregious to me now yeah yeah indeed yeah yeah that would um not be you're right not be conducive in any way yes. to people feeling good <laughs> about um moving their bodies in that way actually I, did, I was just thinking also though we did we are doing some research um at the moment on uh yoga in schools and we've done some interviews with young girls asking them about how they feel about the activity and in fact one of the questions i think was um which, how would you feel about this activity if it was only with girls and with other boys? And I think they're overwhelmingly saying um, they would only feel comfortable in an all-female setting. Yeah. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about, about girls yeah. specifically. What is the sort of body image research on boys? Because I feel like we're getting more sensitive mm. that boys also fail like masculinity standards um, mm. and often have like negative body image. Um, do they have it differently? Are the pressures that apply to them, like how do they deal with it differently? Or Yeah, I think we can say sort of historically, I mean, all, all the research around body image certainly developed a, around thinking about girls and women. And that's because we know that, you know, girls and women were disproportionately affected by eating disorders and distorted eating. And then in fact, um, by negative body image, it's something that was more, um, frequently experienced by women and girls however we know that over the last many or well, the last couple of decades we've we've now seen that this is certainly not an issue that is exclusive um, to girls and women and that increasing numbers of boys and men are also reporting dissatisfaction with bodies and appearances and have similar consequences as well mm. so the consequences that I mentioned before of negative body image also seem to generally hold for um, boys and men indeed. Um, so your question was, is it, is it different? I mean, I think we know that the ideals that are presented for girls and women have been very typically, you know, extremely thin bodies and toned bodies is sort of the ideal that's been upheld by many um in many cultures and for men and boys we have seen this increased focus on muscularity so yeah. um you know we've seen and if we for many studies that look at the cultural representations in the media of bodies we see a very dramatic increase in the size uh, in the muscularity of men's bodies and we see this in magazines mm. and in billboards so we've seen it in children's toys um yeah the, yeah i can imagine that yeah have you seen there's some there's pictures of the GI Joe um, and even Star Wars figures from like the 70s to yeah. the 2000s and you know it's a dramatic change in the ideal body shape that is presented for boys and men in we see that what we call a mesomorphic body shape so it's sort of triangular like wide mm. shoulders narrow waist and increasing muscularity um, around the chest and arms and you know we often say that the ideal body that's presented for women is unrealistic and uh, you know unachievable for almost all women to achieve. Equally, the ideal body shape that is upheld for boys and men is equally unrealistic and unobtainable um, for almost all men and boys to achieve sort of naturally or in a healthy way. Um, so 
unfortunately, it seems that this issue is also, you know, we didn't really want to have, you know, we used to say this is something that's disproportionately affecting girls and women. And I don't think the solution is that <laughs> to mean that yeah. it's also equally damaging for boys and men. But um, so far, it seems that it is um, similar issues that we're seeing. So interesting that you mentioned the toys. I never thought of that. And it reminded me of this huge debate around changing like Barbie's body shape a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. So when mm -hmm. they introduced mm -hmm. like curvier Barbies and I can't imagine, or I can't remember at least any similar debate around Ken, I guess. Um, <laughs> so I remember like this being like a huge thing, like curvier Barbies, but I can't remember there being like talk about <laughs> having a curvier Ken. No, they haven't. Perhaps they haven't just moved to that yet. But yeah. I mean, it was only, it was only, as you said, a few years ago where they finally made some adjustments to Barbie's body shape. And in fact, those adjustments were not actually particularly <laughs> extreme. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. not. In, I'm not in my office at the moment, obviously. But in my office, I actually have a lot of um, the Barbies, and I have Kirby because we did some research with her with very young children. Mm. Um, she's certainly not <laughs> particularly yeah, curvy. Yeah, yeah she is when you compare her to the original barbie but yeah she's still not very curvy um but you know who knows maybe we'll see i'm not sure what less chisel can <laughs> or something um, um i mean sure. i wonder my so my intuition would be that maybe one difference between body image and negative body image specifically between girls and boys is sort of how much they talk with peers about that so mm -hmm. with girls I would imagine that a I guess many of them share similar like body ideals and there can be a lot of sort of negative spiraling in the group towards like an unhealthy mm -hmm. goal but mm -hmm. because this is so I guess open a topic I would imagine that for girls it's less shameful to talk about body ideals well, I guess, mm. I, guess I, I would think that maybe for boys, it's harder to talk to other boys about these kinds of ideas, or is this like an ancient view? Um, no, I think, again, you're right. A lot of the research that has looked at uh, peer interactions around body image, particularly in adolescence, is focused on um, what we might call appearance conversations, or sometimes it's referred to in the research as fat talk so mm. the conversation and all the research that evolved in this area was noting that this was something that was quite unique perhaps to uh, female peer interactions the conversations around you know I'm so fat no you're not I'm so fat mm. and conversations and we you know there's research that has observed the negative consequences of those um, cons uh, of those conversations and has also observed that peer groups seem to share body ideals so within a peer group if there is more negative uh, body image that is often shared and um, perhaps through these conversations and then yeah. strategy you know maybe sharing diet talk and strategies about how to change um, or essentially shrink our bodies um, and I think you're right that those conversations were not observed equally happening in boys I wonder, and this again, it's not something that I've looked at too much, but I wonder if that also might be shifting or might have shifted mm. already in that perhaps because of the um, dominance of the ideal, the sort of appearance ideal pressures that are presented to boys and men um, being so dominant in our culture, perhaps that is now increasing the types of conversations that boys are having. Um, particularly we didn't sort of I didn't sort of mention this before one of the differences of course is in the what they might do about it to meet these ideals one you know requires sort of dieting behaviors perhaps mm. to shrink bodies or to make a thinner or leaner body for girls and women and the other one requires practices to increase um, muscularity in boys and men so I think it's probably quite likely that those conversations are happening about what we can do about it, how to work out our bodies. Yeah. Um, we know that there's been increases in boys' uses of, um, you know, protein shakes, but also mm. more damagingly the use of steroid. Um, yeah. Steroids has increased dramatically in men. 
So those unhealthy behavioural practices to try to achieve this ideal, um, I imagine are discussed now with boys and men. And I mean, similarly, I guess a similar question comes up for parents because um, I remember like a debate where it was basically about like parents should stop telling girls you look so beautiful today um, when they grow mm -hmm. up or you really look great today and you're going to do well or something like linking beauty or appearance to worth, mm -hmm. value, performance, mm -hmm. something like that. And it was said like you rarely say the same things to boys, but you really do that for girls. Um, and we should stop like inducing children and specifically girls into thinking that their appearance is intrinsically related to their value. Um, mm. So does the same thing come up that boys body image is just not as communicated by parents as much as assertive body image for girls? I think you're probably right. Well, you are right in your observation that there's definitely gendered um, ways that parents have been speaking to their children and mm. that there is an increased emphasis on appearance when speaking to girl children over boy children. Um, I don't know, I think if your questions, I don't know if it's sort of, if that's shifting as well. Um, but I think, yeah, ideally we would be removing any, um, focus on appearance for all children um, because yeah. regardless of the gender that as you said it's linking appearance to worth and value and success and happiness isn't it um, and I don't think any children really need to be given that message yeah. that appearance and beauty is what they should be striving for I agree I mean just to, to say the last thing about that um because I really want to talk with you what you think like we can do to remedy these kinds of things. Um, I read like Martha Nussbaum's, I think it's called Human Development and Capabilities yesterday. And it's of course like about something sort of different, but she mentioned research. And of course, like that book was written in the 90s. So I don't know how like recent that is, but it really struck me because she described research which involved, I think, very young babies. And um, they had these like babies sort of put in front of adults and the same baby labeled with different gender ascriptions was treated differently like literally the mm -hmm. same child um, mm -hmm. and their mm -hmm. cries were interpreted differently they were hugged more or less and they were mm -hmm. held closer or further apart and that just really struck me like this was literally the same person mm -hmm. um, and it yeah. just mattered whether it was called female or male and that was yeah, Just mind blowing to me. Yes, yeah. it is mind blowing, isn't it? That those gendered ideals and reactions are prevalent at such an early age, as you say, yeah. a baby that actually, you know, looks no differently in any yeah. way. And the labeling seems to completely influence how we behave and react yeah. to that child. Um, I guess, you know, there's a stream of parent, you know, there's a push for sort of gender neutral parenting, yeah. and that would yeah. be. Um, <laughs> good evidence um, in support of, of that approach. Um, however, of course, these things are so deeply ingrained in our society um, that, you know, it's hard, you know, we don't live in a bubble. <laughs> it feels a little bit like we live in a bubble right yeah. now, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> but the influence of others, you know, is something that's much harder to control. We can, of course, control that in our own unique bubbles but then children have interaction yeah. from other people <laughs> that um, are much more difficult for us to control and is there like body image research on like gender queer or transgender children um, so something like beyond the binary basically yeah, it's definitely something that needs more research. There is emerging research in this field, not something that I have been involved with yet, um, but definitely something that is emerging and needs a lot more of our attention and understanding. So, as I said, I really want to hear your view on like what we should do to improve body image, considering you know the wide range of consequences you you mentioned mm. earlier. Um, so what do you think are like some good solutions that or 
policies that are employed at the moment or I mean you know in reverse what are some really bad policies mm. that we still see which don't really mm. have an effect or it might even be making it worse mm. okay let's I think before that it, we've sort of in the way that we've talked about it sort of relates to some potential solutions we could be thinking about solutions at an individual level mm. um, like implementing evidence-based prevention and intervention strategies that try to aim to promote positive body image yeah. that's sort of something that uh, I do and have been involved in and is really important so I mean we might think about um, school-based programs that try to encourage young people to think about their bodies in particular ways and more positive um, ways and that's definitely um, a strategy that we do and should be promoting but we can also think about um approaches at a broader societal level mm. um so you know we've sort of touched upon some of those things but promoting you know can we make changes in the way that bodies and appearances are presented in the media for instance so pr promoting the fact that hey guess what we all come in different shapes and sizes mm. and that's fantastic and fabulous and something that we should be um promoting and that there's many many ways of having a healthy body um so we can you know there we could be thinking about public health campaigns that promote healthful behaviors rather than weight um and then i think it's also really important for us to think at an even more broader level yeah. about challenging systems of inequality because you know, thinking about the systems that disproportionately impact on certain groups in society. And that's probably been even less thought about, um, but something that I think we need to, you know, right at the beginning when I talked about these individual factors and these social cultural factors, we really need to even then situate that in an even broader context about wider uh, social inequalities. So I think, it provides us with multiple avenues and I think we probably need to do all of those approaches mm. to be successful in really tackling what is such a multifaceted and complicated problem. Um, I think you did you also mention about sort of public health campaigns or, yeah, for example. or, what, or what's yeah. not helpful. I think many um, anti-obesity campaigns campaigns and public health campaigns some that we've seen in this country even very recently um, can be and are stigmatizing um, so weight focused public health campaigns and even school initiatives that are based on weight um, risk perpetuating weight stigma disordered eating health inequalities by focusing solely on weight as a metric of health. And we have substantial bodies of evidence that demonstrate that weight stigma itself, in fact, predicts a whole host of negative consequences, very similar to the ones that I've yeah. spoken about with regards to body image. You know, all these negative consequences can actually be linked also to experiences of weight stigma. Mm. not actual anything about the size of the body yeah, itself yeah. but the experiences that are reported and the stigmatizing um, attitudes and behaviors that are experienced by people in larger bodies seems to be linked to the the whole host of negative consequences so many of those strategies that are sort of focusing on obesity can be extremely problematic um you know they're promoting fear and shame mm, and we mm. know that this is not going to be effective campaigns as well so um you know we need to sort of get rid of any of those campaigns and messaging that really um yeah again highlights that weight is the primary indicator of health uh, it also feeds into those stereotypes that we talked about before that yeah. that size is an indicator of your success as mm. a person um, you know, this is again promoting a very narrow view of health. So we need to see public health campaigns that focus on other aspects of health, like encouraging positive relationships with our bodies and with movement and activity, mm. positive relationships with food. Um, you know, that's what I'd like to see sort of at those campaign um, 
levels. And of course, I'd love to see those sort of really broader systemic changes that are um, focusing on inequalities by looking at food insecurity, the role of socioeconomic status on health and weight and addressing poverty and equal access to food and things like that. Um, yeah, I'd love to see, you know, campaigns and uh, policies focusing on addressing health inequalities. <laughs> yeah, I think that's so important because I myself, I only really recently had like understood just how important these social factors are for health. I mean, they run this module for first year medicine students here, which is the social and ethical context of health. And mm. Um, I was doing like the seminars because of course like I know a little bit about like medicine ethics and that stuff but the first part is this social aspect of health and it really struck me like I did not anticipate how just how big the impact is of our social environment of like society-wide inequalities on on our health and how yeah just how yeah. important it is and that it really just basically cannot be overstated that it's how important it is compared to like putting responsibility on the individual on the individual yeah, yeah. absolutely and I, so you know while I said most of my research probably does focus on individual level um, strategies you know these do not exist in a vacuum and it's naive to think that you know, we can do something about these in a in a vacuum without yeah big systemic changes that are looking at those things exactly as you're talking about who has access to yeah. things that make it easier to have healthful behaviors yeah. how far away you know and it, and it these are big these are big problems aren't they you know they're big yeah. um problems that aren't necessarily easy or quick to solve but definitely um, need to be considered in the way ahead otherwise we're not going to be successful and I think this is actually really drawn out during this pandemic <laughs> um, I feel yes, like that um, you get a lot of this course which is really individual focused um, both like in public health generally but on like maintaining weight or exercise as well while you're stuck mm. inside um, but I feel like it also really highlights like so much is out of your control um, and so much of like access to food access to you know online delivery services um, yeah. money like to I don't know buy takeout instead of having to go to a supermarket these like there's yeah. so much going into what social position you occupy within this Absolutely. pandemic and, and I think and this who is, has yeah. access to green space and yeah. you yeah. know and things like uh you know environmental considerations yeah. when um yeah we're in this lockdown and pandemic situation yeah it, it's highlighted a whole lot of inequalities yeah. <laughs> um as we know um so just talking about sort of trends so what is your view on what has now over a couple of years emerged as body positivity across mm. social media. And then I guess more recently, body neutrality, um, mm. where people have pushed, like you don't have to be positive about everything in your body. Mm. You just kind of need to accept it. So what's your view on that? Do you think this has overall been like a good, good trend? Oh, it's a complex question. Yes. And I probably got a complex answer, of course, not a nice neat answer. Um, I think, you know, what we probably refer to as the body positive movement on social media, which really, you know, has became mainstream and popular in perhaps the last, I don't know, eight or nine years, perhaps. Um, and here, you know, I'm talking about content that is promoting the messages that all bodies are good bodies and acceptance of self just as we are and the normalization of flaws in our bodies and the normalization of differences. Um, these are all great messages and you know I think we often and, and I'm probably guilty of this particularly uh, when we think about the influence of social media on body image we often focus on the negatives and you know, mm. the promotion of very narrow ideals and harmful messages which we sort of have talked about previously and you know the fitspiration and things like that we've often focused on sort of the negatives of um, this environment and 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 I have indeed in my research focused on understanding the role or the influence of the, the, these negative aspects but I think it's really important for us to also remember the positives of social media environment in general which is of course 
that we ourselves are the, now the creators of our own content and the mm. curators of our yeah. content. And I think, you know, it, it may be hard, particularly for uh, young people who have grown up surrounded and immersed by this technology. But previously, of course, we only used to be um, consumers of messages, the other media messages that other people gave to us. And we could only sort of consume um, the messages that were out there. And the very, very powerful thing about social media is the fact that, yeah, I can create my own content. Other people can create their own content. I can choose which content I see in my um, feed. Yeah, I create my own feed. Um, and the upside of that, I think, one upside of that is the fact that we are seeing diverse bodies and appearances and stories um, on social media that perhaps we did not ever see before. And I think that's got to be really considered as a, as a good thing. It's great to see more diversity in, um, in, the, in the media that we consume in general, and this is going to have a good effect. So, but having said that, on the flip side, the movement um, has received some criticism, and I think a lot of this criticism is often fair. Um, the roots of the body positive movement can actually be traced back to the 1960s and fat, fat activism and fat mm. liberation movements, and I think that's really important, and much of the influence also came from Black women yeah. and activists. And there's much criticism that some of these critical influences have been lost in the yeah. current yeah. version of body positivity. It's often called whitewashed. Yeah. And um, a lot of the original like fat, fat activists think that, you know, there's still only <laughs> acceptable levels of yeah. body diversity that are presented in this sort of body positive movement. You know, we can be big, but only a certain mm. range before it's, it's viewed negatively again. And I think, um, you know, as, as I said, I think that criticism is, is very valid. Yeah. And I believe that it, rightly that these critics would argue that, you know, the body positivity movement is nothing if it's not going to include all marginalised mm. bodies. Yeah. Um, so I do agree with that. And um, so I'd like to see even more inclusivity in this space. And I think that over time, you know, that will hopefully have a positive impact on acceptance of diversity in general. I mean, I'd also like to see, you know, more other types of marginalised bodies as well, like... Um, yeah, there's a lot more that we could be doing there that I think could have a really positive impact on acceptance of diversity. Um, but I think the other criticism, as I said, also that you picked up, I think, in your question, it also seems to, for some people, have put like this extra pressure. Oh my gosh, I now have to love my body. Hmm. Do I have to love my body? And and that's what you're referring to, um, in that there's sort of been a pushback against that. Um, in perhaps yeah a, a more position or and I think I probably agree with this as well position of more neutrality is where we actually want to land like, like I don't want to be having to think do I love my body enough today yeah <laughs> um yeah. you know want to move to appreciation of bodies and we know that many of these factors are tied to what we would call theoretically positive body image which is acceptance of broad um diversity so that's sort of the one thing that we might think of in um the body positive movement yes guess what bodies come in all different sizes and that's great and all can be beautiful but we also want to see appreciation of functionality so mm -hmm. appreciating that our bodies can do different things for us and that they can do all these wonderful things for us um and just yeah i think yeah movement towards that acceptance which probably also ties a little bit to self-compassion yeah. and kindness is just you know I'm, I may, I'm okay, and I'm, I'm happy, and, um, yeah, neutral would probably be a good place to be. <laughs> yeah. Well. So that's quite a complicated answer. Sorry, I think, no, I think no, there are yeah. many positive. Yeah. I think there are many positives of the the movement and the diversity that we see in social media. Yeah. But equally, it comes with some sort of caveats. <laughs> I mean. 
for what it's worth, at least for me, that's been such an interesting conversation. And um, it's certainly given me a lot to think about. And I just want to thank you again for coming onto this format and for like sharing your your research with us um, today. And I hope, you know, you enjoyed it. I did. Thank you so much for um, inviting me. I thought it was a really interesting conversation. I'm really looking forward to hearing your other conversations in the <laughs> series as well. It sounds like it's going to be a really interesting um series as a whole so thank you for the invitation thank you so much i mean i hope you have a good rest of your day um thank you, thank you.